you all hear me? Really? Okay. Hello, my name is Ryan. I'm a Speak Freely advocate uh, for Students for Liberty. I'm also a campus coordinator. Uh, and I'm here to introduce our next speaker. Uh, his name is uh, Faisal uh, Al Mutar. Uh, some of you might know him. He is the leader of the secular caliphate of Iraq and Syria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, Faisal is an Iraqi born writer, uh, satirist, computer geek, and human rights activist. Forged intellectually in Iraq during the post 9 11 U.S. invasion, uh, Faisal continues to believe that the best path forward for Iraq is a government that respects the economic and personal freedoms uh, of the individual. Faisal is also an advocate for secularism, human rights, and the free market of ideas. A big enthusiast of the intersection of technology and advocacy, Faisal is the founder of the Global Secular Humanist Movement and Ideas Beyond Borders. Please welcome Faisal. Thank you. Later. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry if I, I have some sensitivity, sensitivity to lights. So if I'm going to cry, please forgive me. Uh, no, because I have, like, this came out recently. I don't know. I think it's a result of alcoholism. Um, so, um, well, this is my first time in Maryland. This is my, I mean, I've been doing a speaking tour. Uh, to be honest, I'm not very impressed. What the hell is this? Uh, it looks like Syria without the chemical attacks. Um, so... What I'm going to talk about, I mean, this is uh, a research. I mean, it's kind of a research I've been doing, watching lots of footage of uh, related to, again, this is the crying thing, uh, because of the lights. Yeah, so uh, of how Islam is being discussed across the media. So uh, I'm going to be like Marco Rubio drinking water here. Um, so the... Um, uh, that this is a result of footage that I've watched around uh, of, with the help of tequila, of how Islam is being discussed in uh, U.S. media. So the, the reason why, I mean, this is, so this is kind of the thesis of the research, is that why is because of the growing, I mean, the reason why I'm, uh, I've written this research is because of the growing obscurantism that discussion um, about Islam that made, sorry, <coughs> that made it impossible to have any discussion whatsoever about Islam without terms like bigot, racist, xenophobe, Uncle Tom being thrown around in national television. So I've done this research and, um, to kind of p uh, categorize many of the people who talk about Islam in the media and the uh, debate concerning Islam and Muslims and because it became so polarized between far left and far right between those who believe that Islam is a peaceful religion, which it is, no, joking, um, <laughs> and those who believe that uh, we should deport all Muslims or we should, uh, I think somebody's here deporting one, I call deport all Muslims, sorry. Um, so well, those who want to do travel bans and generalize on all Muslims are being terrorists or extremists and so on. So the, 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 these people that I've identified belong to I mean, five or six major groups, and, um, and those who mostly talk about Islam unfortunately belong to these six groups, except one group that I consider to be our allies. So the first one is Muslim, so the top five are Muslim conservatives, Muslim quote-unquote moderates, uh, Muslim reformers, pseudo-liberal apologists, which I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about these assholes, um, and genuine critics of Islam who are, I consider to be allies. And then there is the pro-Christian rights, uh, far-right Jewish and Christian groups, who many of them are quite nut jobs. So, which I'm gonna also touch upon a lot. So, um, so first of all, the, I also identify groups, and I also identify definitions, and one of the definitions is the difference between Islam and Islamism. So Islam is a religion, and Islamism is the f trying to force conservative Islam on the rest of society. So, and this is some of the terms I'm gonna use in this speech, and there's jihadism, which is violent Islamism. Does that make any sense? Okay, good. Allahu um, Akbar. So, um, number one, the Muslim conservatives. So, Muslim conservatives are those who believe that Islam is perfect, and the Hadith and the Quran as a whole contain no, no errors. They view liberalism as a Western invention, incompatible with their interpretation of the faith, they believe that there is a cosmic war happening between the Muslim world and the West. The majority of them 
are nonviolent, as Trump would say, I assume some of them are good people. Um, but the ultra-conservatives among them, whether they are Salafist or Wahhabi, who tend to follow the more conservative approach of Islam, tend to support violent jihadism against the West, and those also who are, belong to sects that are not Wahhabi, so they support killing of Ahmadiyya and Shia within Muslim-dominated countries. So um, few of these groups engage in the Western media, so you don't see them quite much. They mostly show up in Arabic television, like Al Jazeera Arabic and uh, Akra channel, and, and, and the thing is like, one of the things I wrote an article recently about Al Jazeera, I mean, Al Jazeera is Fox News in the Arab world with steroids. So they are one of the most ultra-conservative networks in the Arab world. But here in English, they talk about pandas and Black Lives Matter and how evil America is. And I actually would like to ask you to check my interview in which I detail most of my expose, the difference between the English and the Arabic one. So then there is the Muslim moderates, who are those who are the mostly being invited to the media. Those also consider Islam to be perfect and um, the Quran and the Hadith to be inherent. However, they don't follow the interpretations that advocate violent jihad. So that's the difference between them and the uh, Wahhabis. So they deny that there is a link between jihad, uh, oh, sorry, between like the terrorist groups like ISIS and, and Al Qaeda with Islam. There's always this hashtag, hashtag not my Islam, hashtag not my president. They kind of, no, that's a different one, but anyway. Um, so the, the hashtag uh, uh, ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. And they always try to say this is a different uh, uh, religion or the ISIS is just a result of U.S. foreign policy. And they say that Islam is a religion of peace and terrorism has nothing to do with Islam and the terrorist groups are un-Islamic. And the, so their views on human rights, the Muslim moderates, are from a very big spectrum. So they, some of them advocate, advocate killing gays and the other ones are supporters of gay rights. So people like Linda Sarsour, who was... Uh, uh, no comment. Um, um, is one of the people who try to advocate for LGBT rights and women's rights, quote unquote, uh, Islamic perspective. She's called Prophet Muhammad a feminist, fake news. Um, so their views on human rights cover from a very a big spectrum, but th so they, they defend in general the right for women to wear a headscarf, and they are against uh, requiring them by law. So many of this believe in, many of them don't support this notion that there is a war between Islam and the West, and but they try to justify terrorism as a way that is a way of addressing grievances against Western imperialism or the West support for Israel. So there's always this argument that they make is that well, if Israel never invaded Gaza, then there would be no ISIS. They keep repeating the same thing. They always blame eventually the U.S. and U.S. foreign policy and the state of Israel for most of the reason why these terrorist groups exist. Or some of them engage in conspiracy theory that, that uh, Dave Rubin created ISIS. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, good job, buddy. Uh, so, in the main, so the Muslim moderates argue that, again, terrorist groups have nothing to do with Islam and they're either created as a reaction, they're created as a reaction to Western colonialism. That's where most of the argument goes. And so the Muslim moderate organizations have high profile of the media. That's why they're the ones who have pushed these arguments in, in, in liberal, mostly liberal media like NPR and MSNBC and others. So organizations like CARE and ISNA and CAGE, which is in the United Kingdom, and people, individuals like Linda, Dil Abdullah, and Murtaza Hussein, who called a friend of ours, Majid Nawaz, a porch monkey, uh, but unfortunately he wasn't fired from the company, even though he said a racial slur, but, and people like Mehdi Hassan, who works with Al Jazeera English. Um, and there's, there's the other group that is kind of coming out recently, which is called the Muslim Reformers. I don't know if you're familiar with many of them, but the names like Majid Nawaz, Ayan, not Ayan. Ayan is now becoming a reformer, but people like Aslan Omani, Majid, and, and, uh, and others, those who agree that that uh, the Quran is not perfect and that there has to be some interpretations that are compatible with the 21st century. So they try to rally against extremist interpretations and they try to create new interpretations in keeping with modern liberal values. Uh, they accept that there is a link between radical interpretation of Islam and terrorism, so they're not the type of, it's nothing to do with Islam uh, hashtag. Um, and, and these are people that, unfortunately, because of the narrative that has been pushed by Liberals, these are people who are getting the most censorship. I mean, Ayan Hersali recently had to cancel her speech in Australia 
mainly for security reasons, but it's also because of this movement of censorship against people like them, because they're quote-unquote don't fit the narrative, and if they criticize Islam, they're feeding more into Islamophobia and hate speech, et cetera, et cetera, that eventually cancels all the conversation that happens within the Muslim world in trying to make it a, a better and more liberal one, um, at least within the social liberal, and how many people will get triggered by the term liberal here. Um, so, so this, I'm, I mean, this is the minorities, in Majid Nawaz's book, Radical, is he said, like, these are the minorities within the minorities that li liberals, or at least the left, uh, are harming the most by doing all the censorship laws and trying to beat hate speech laws. Even most of what they talk about is not hate speech. I mean, Majid uh, recently also got put on the Southern Law Poverty Center, uh, anti-Muslim extremist, which is complete garbage. I mean, the guy himself say he's a Muslim, but because, because he doesn't fit the narrative that liberals are trying to push then, and therefore he, many and others like him, I mean, even me, I don't know why I'm not getting canceled enough, which is good, but, but I know many people are, uh, maybe because I'm, I'm handsome, maybe that's the reason. Uh, that, that's what my mom thinks, not, that's, that's not true. Um, so then there is the, so that is the group that I call the pseudo-liberal apologists. I mean, they claim to be liberal, but most of what they stand for is, by most definitions, illiberal. I mean, censorship is illiberalism. Siding with uh, people who support killing gays is not the liberal thing to do. Um, but they refer to themselves as liberals, so I call them pseudo-liberals. Some people call them pseudo-leftists, but uh, I think pseudo-liberal, and, and Majid Nawaz coined the term that aggressive left to describe them. Um, because, I mean, they mostly exist on the left, even though not, not to say that the right have their own regressives. I mean, I coined this term anti-regressives regressives. So those people who are so much anti-regressive, but at the same time hold regressive ideas, uh, like social conservatives, like Sean Hannity and all this basket of deplorables, right? So they hold, like, many conservative regressive ideas, but they are also anti-regressive left. So it's kind of a weird place that we are in right now, because on, on one hand, I criticize the regressive left, and on the other hand, the people who have been championing criticizing the regressive left also hold regressive ideas, like theocracy and uh, pro-life views. I mean, I know that some people might disagree on that, but, but they still hold many regressive ideas. So people like us, and one of the terms that Ruben popularized, the, the new center, is that those of us who are kind of stuck in the middle between these two crazies. So the, one of the major crazies is the pseudo-liberal left, who agree a lot with, so they, they try to push the moderate Muslim argument, which is, it all has to do with U.S. foreign policy, uh, Islam is a religion of peace, those who criticize it are a bunch of racist, Islamophobes, uh, Zionists, whatever. Um, and then, so, and, and people like, for example, Gary Greenwald and Noam Chomsky, who I consider to be kind of the father of the regressive left, at least when it comes to foreign policy, is that he pushed for ages this concept that everything revolves around America and uh, if, I don't know, if I, the United States never intervened in Iraq, there would be no, no Islamic extremism, even though Islamic extremism existed for decades. Um, so they have constantly been pushing this argument that it's always the West's fault. And any kind of discussion about reform within Muslim communities or outside Muslim communities is a form of racism or bigotry, and, you know, or hold their kind of, kind of form of neoconservatism that trying to kill all Muslims and, and steal the resources. And this, I mean, uh, this uh, agenda of the regressive left has made it all across academia, and including some people within the Obama administration that Obama hired as counterterrorism uh, individuals. They generally pushed that concept that uh, the war against ISIS is not an ideological war. It's more about just like dealing with generic terrorism, like uh, drug cartels and stuff, in which all what you need, if you created more jobs, there would be no ISIS. And, uh, and I wish it was that easy. If you create more jobs, there would be ISIS. No, I mean ISIS. But it's not because many of these individuals actually happen to have jobs, and some of them are actually richer than most people in this venue, um, including people like Osama bin Laden, who used to be very, comes from a very rich family. And there are people who are neurosurgeons and doctors and all of that who left the UK, left Canada, left the US and joined terrorist groups. So, that's, so they have been pushing this argument that the war against ISIS or the war against terrorism is mostly um, just, I mean, if the US just stops intervenes, if we just create more jobs, um, and that's it. Problem of terrorism will be solved. And unfortunately, this is false, and because they try to ignore the ideological narrative that these groups have been pushing. I mean, one of the analogies I created is that 
ISIS and Boko Haram are like, they're like uh, AIDS. And, and they are the symptom of the disease, not the disease itself. So ideology is the HIV. So we have to cure the HIV, not only deal with the symptom, which is ISIS and terrorist groups. We have to create a counter narrative of, against extremism. So then there is the uh, genuine critics of Islam, who I consider to be allies, people like Ruben and, and, uh, and me and my clone. Um, is the, <laughs> uh, many of them are coming to criticize Islam from a purely human rights um, um, uh, a kind of liberal perspective. And those who believe that there is a connection between sub-interpretation of Islam and violent behavior. And they share many, many agreements with Muslim reformers. That's why many of them tend to be allies uh, with Muslim reformers. And they think that Islam in the 21st century res 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 presents a special case compared to other religions. Because one of the main arguments that regressive use is that all religions are the same. And th this is fake news. Because in the 21st century, you can have the Book of Mormon in Broadway, and nobody's worried about Mitt Romney blowing the Book of Mormon, <laughs> or, his, or his relatives, right? Nobody's worried about Mitt Romney blowing things up, right? But let's have the Book of Islam in Broadway, and let's see what happens. And then people say, no, but all religions are the same. Well, that, well and, I, and I've had this, I think, debate in Ohio, not Ohio, well, all the same, they're Mid Midwest states, Ohio, Omaha, <laughs> um, one, of these, one of these states. Um, and then I told them, okay, let's have two pictures. I'm going to draw Jesus and you draw Muhammad, and let's see who gets more hate mail. And I think with that, tonight we have Fleming Rose from the Danish cartoons, I think I recognize him, um, who draw cartoons of, of, of Prophet Muhammad, and there were so many riots and embassies were burned. Well, you can actually make so many de depictions of other religions, and you, are, you don't need to worry about your life. And, but the regressives have been pushing this argument that you no, know, all religions are, and there's this, all religions have their extremes. They have this cliche words they mostly use. All religions are the same, all religions have their own extremes, but what, what the, the genuine critics of Islam get right is that Islam in the 21st century represents a very different um, scenario. It's not like other religions. Not to say that other religions are benevolent. I mean, I, I mostly compare them to between meth and cocaine. So, I mean, somebody can make the argument that meth is actually worse than cocaine, and which is probably true. Um, I'm not a drug addict, so I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk as an expert on this subject. But uh, I hope you get my point. So, like, I mean, I, I don't think that religions are benevolent in general, but I think that in the 21st century, um, some religions are worse than others. And I think that Islam represents on the top of the chain when it comes to what is the most extreme. So those who I consider to be the genuine critics of Islam, they care about issues like women's rights and LGBT rights. As I said, they come from a more of a human rights uh, perspective and more of a liberal perspective. So the, the, they view Islam itself as a religion that is needs of reformation and modernization, or in some cases, maybe the solution is not to have religion at all in some of these majority Muslim countries, even though some people suggest that this is a very unlikely uh, scenario in which we can apostatize 1.5 billion Muslims, but it's worth trying, in my opinion. Um, so, I mean, they generally view, have a very critical views of Christianity. I mean, people like Sam Harris uh, wrote the book, Letters to a Christian Nation, which is itself, the whole book is a critical of Christianity. And yet, when he criticizes Islam, people tell him, well, why don't you say things about Christianity? Idiots, I wrote a book about the subject. So, like, what else do you want? But they always use this argument that if you just criticize Islam, they'll be like, oh, why, how about Christianity? How about the Crusades? This is another hashtag. How about the Crusades? Whenever somebody criticizes, whenever there's a terrorist attack and a Muslim happening and you criticize Islam, somebody tells you, well, how about the Crusaders? Well, how about this? Uh, I, thought, I thought the Bat Batistan County is that whenever there is a terrorist attack, they say, well, but the Christians do this. Well, um, so, I mean, these people who are genuine, I think, who are really on the uh, good side of history, are critical of, of all religions, but they tend to differentiate between um, Islam and other religions in an issue of violence. Also, they tend to differentiate between Islam as an ideology and set of ideas and the people who adhere to their religion. I mean, there is a difference between, uh, I mean, somebody can hate smoking without necessarily hate smokers, right? So you can, somebody can dislike the idea and try to push for reform of that idea without necessarily hating the people. So, and that would make them different to the other group. So, I mean, one of the names I can mention to you for those who know how to use Google search um, is people like 
Richard Dawkins, Rubin, Sam Harris, Bulmar, Salman Rushdie, Al Rizvi, who's a dear friend of mine, Hamid Abdul Samad, Salah Haider. These are most people that I think are the good side of history, is that they try to differentiate between ideas and people, that they are not anti Muslim bigots, which I'm going to talk about in other, the next group, which I think is literally bigots in that discussion. And um, so these people who are mostly made of people who believe in Judeo Christian cosmic war between Islam and, and uh, Christianity and Judaism. And they, they tend to engage in so many generalizations um, about Islam um, or about Muslims as terrorists. And some of them, I mean, I've watched some of the videos that these people uh, do in which they say, like, Prophet Muhammad, for example, is the Antichrist. And they say that there is a connection between Islam and Satanism. And I mean, this is like the dark side of YouTube. I don't recommend anyone watching it. But I, but I, I mean, there's a lot of dark side of YouTube, especially the punching of Richard Spencer. So, I mean, I don't support the punching, but the remix videos are really cool. Uh, I, 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 could, I think people should watch it. It's actually very cool. Um, so, they, so the general view, also of you have a very negative views about not only Islam and Muslims, but also about other immigrants and minorities too. Uh, one of the people is Ann Coulter, which I think many people of you already know her. Um, and I mean, Milo Yiannopoulos, one of the debates that Rubin uh, mentioned with him is that he doesn't differentiate between Muslims and Islam. Um, and there are others who, um, I mean, people like Pamela Geller or Robert Spencer, I don't know if you guys know these people. I mean, one of the, Robert Spencer tweeted that I'm a secret jihadist. I'm like, wow. Uh, do you really think I'm that smart, that I'm hiding, I've been faking it all along? Uh, and I mean, one of the people he retweeted is like, Faisal is trying to push Sharia law in the name of atheism. I'm like, no, I'm trying to push shawarma law, not Sharia law. The, there, is a, there is a difference between those. Um, so, so, so they generally have, tell, tend to be, have bigoted views e even against ex-Muslims. So they think uh, ex-Muslims are also practicing taqiyya, which sounds like tequila, but it's not. Um, but it's like, it, they say like people like us are lying in defense of Islam. They were actually faking it uh, so we can establish like Arabia and, and kind of Sharia law in the country. Uh, and and uh, so, so they, they operate a lot of platform of fear mongering. We should fear anybody named Muhammad, anybody named Ali. And many of them don't have any values that are something to do with the human rights or secular liberal values, but rather they have their own Christian theocracy versus Muslim theocracy. So it's like a circus. Um, so the, and, and then they try to, I mean, to some extent, if you look at people like uh, Terry Crews, I mean, not, not, uh, I don't think he's a, much of a bigot, but he is coming to criticism of radical Islam from radical Christian view. So again, he's a, he's a cocaine addict versus a meth addict. It's like, uh, so this is this a type of people that I th think are not really credible in the war of ideas that we're engaging against the Islamic radicalism. And many of them engage in lots of conspiracy theories that Prophet, that, not Prophet, uh, Prophet Obama, let's say Prophet Obama, well, President Barack Obama, former President Barack Obama, he is a, a, a secret Muslim and, and have publicized these theories all over um, that he is a kind of a secret Muslim that's trying to impose Sharia law. I mean, if, if, if uh, Obama is a secret Muslim, he's the best Muslim ever, right? He's like, he drinks alcohol, his daughters go to college, like, uh, what else do you want? I mean, if this is, if, if, if Obama is a Muslim, this is the Muslim we want to have. Um, so, I mean, how, how, what, what, uh, what I learned from this research and study is that um, how much of these people, how do you know this person is a credible or less credible, is to see how much they engage in broad generalizations. So, I mean, Mark Twain once said, all generalizations are false, including this one. Um, and you see how much of these people who talk about Islam engage in generalizations like Muslims are, ex-Muslims are. The more that you see them engaging in more generalization, the, the, the more they are less credible. So the, the less generalizations they make, the better, because people have to be very specific when you're talking about a big sample of 1.5 billion. Um, and what is the apparent intention behind this person of crisis of Islam? Is it offered in a, coming from a person of reason and, and, and evidence, or is it coming from another bigotry um, against different religion. So um, I can answer probably some of the rest of the speech in the Q&A. So I hope that's the end of it. So thank you very much for listening. And may reason and science to bless you.
good thing I didn't cry, right? I, um, I blame the Jews for the. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. So who who manages the Q and A? Like, oh, I can manage it. Oh, okay. thank you. Uh, yeah, the. Well, I mean, I, I Ben Shapiro seems to, seems to be seems to be quite reasonable. I mean, I, I disagree with him on some of the issues. Uh, I mean, well, Stephen Cowder is more of a troll, right? So why should I take him seriously? So with with Ben Shapiro, I think he's more rational, uh, and somebody can engage with him in a conversation. Um, than, yeah. So I, I'll probably consider him, even though I disagree with him, but he's. But he's coming from a more rational perspective. He's more data-driven than, let's say, ideology-driven and emotionally-driven than Christian theocrats. So, well. uh, how big was the sample of media, and how did their methodology look like? Was it the first question or the second one? You said that um, in order to counter um, terrorism, we need to have a proper narrative. Yes. So how That's actually a very excellent question. So the first question is I've looked at, I mean, I, I forgot the exact number, but it's like hundreds of hours of interviews between Arab, I mean, I speak two languages. I'm not bisexual, I'm bilingual. Um, so I have looked at, langu looked at hundreds of hours of media interviews in Arab and English media, talking about whenever there's a terrorist attack. Um, okay, what happened after the discussion in France and Belgium and all these terrorist attacks? And I've looked at the footage between like the English speaking media, BBC, the uh, CNN and Fox News, um, and also within the Arabic media, like Al Jazeera and Arabia and stuff. So um, do I want it to be more of a bigger sample? Of course. Anyone who is doing, I'm not an expert in statistics, so I'm not going to, so anybody who has expertise in this subject, please take this project and pay me some dollars. Just buy me a pack of cigarettes, that will be fine. Um, so when it comes to other questions, how can we agree on a counter-narrative? Um, I mean, we can agree that there are some things that are wrong, right? So we can agree that we need to stop female genital mutilation in the Middle East, or Muslim world, right? And even Muslim communities in the West. So there are some things that I think we can all agree on that, that we need to prevent this from happening, as whether what is the best counter-narrative. Uh, on a personal level, I think we have to push for liberal and secular counter-narrative. Uh, there have been many, within, at least within the Obama administration, they have and provide a program called the CVE program, the Counterbound Extremism program. So, which I think that's where we met. It was at an event, a CVE event or a CVE conference. And their, their method is that, first of all, not call it by its name. We call it, they call it CVE, it's counter, for Countering Violent Extremism. So it's, even though everybody invited is a brown guy, and their name is Muhammad and Ali. But we're not going to say it's Islamic extremism because that may trigger some people to join ISIS. So they... So even though it is about Islamic extremism, so they're not talking about how can we counter Steven Crowder, they are talking about how can we counter ISIS. But no, everybody wants not to mention what they are actually fighting. I mean, even if it's... Uh, so, we, I mean, we have to acknowledge that there is a problem within Muslim communities. We have to identify it. And then, as what is the counter narrative, I think that we have to push a more human rights oriented and liberal and secular values versus giving... Uh, small doses of extremism. I mean, I mean, extremism light, to me, is also extremism. I mean, Bud Light is still a beer, even though it's shit, but still a beer. Um, so so we, can, we should not push, I mean, some people argue that we should, what I call Bud Light Islam, that we have to push Bud Light Islam against tequila Islam, right? Um, but I think that we actually need to get out of the theological, uh, uh, just, sorry, the theological argument all the way. We have to push for just just like, for example, the human rights campaign, I think human rights campaign, in which when they were arguing for same-sex marriage, they were not saying, well, what Jesus actually said about same-sex marriage. It was like, love is love. Simple message, human rights-oriented. It was able to reach much more beyond than just, oh, what the theology and what prophet Jesus said in the Bible, verses 3, 44, whatever. Um, so, like, I think that if we push kind of messaging equivalent to what the human rights campaign did, in which we tried to push a human rights oriented that killing people from different religions is not good, uh, killing apostates is not good, people have the right for freedom of religion, look how wonderful diversity is. I mean, we have to kind of push up, uh, and we have to let people from there who believe in these ideas speak these ideas. We cannot make it as a kind of a trickle down 
approach in which the Americans or the West are like, oh, you guys should behave this way. But rather, we have to empower those who believe in these ideas there against the extremists in their own communities. That's the way that I'm doing it. And hopefully, within my organization, this is the main thing we're going to accomplish. The guy with the green, is this green? Yeah. OK. Oh, nice. Sorry, it's a prophet Hitchens. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I recall his holiness, Christopher Hitchens, uh, saying, uh, saying that Please be upon him, yeah. Were he writing in the 1920s and the 1930s, he would have been writing primarily against uh, Catholicism because of its open allowance of Catholicism. Um, and so do you, do, you, do you agree with that, or do you think he was understating the, the inherent differences between Catholicism and Islam? Well, I mean, to answer your first question, I mean, I mean, that's what I was arguing for, is that not all religions are the same. And not all people adhere to these religions are on, on the same level. So those who tend to be, I mean, Muslim conservatives and those who really adhere to a literal interpretation of Islam make up a much larger percentage of the Muslim world than Christian conservatives. Uh, even though those who claim to be Christian conservatives uh, say they are conservatives, but they are, in fact, they flip-flop a lot. I mean, you, you can have... Christians who have sex without marriage, or before marriage, right? And yet they still claim to be Christian conservatives. So while in Islam, it's very unlikely that someone claims to be a Muslim conservative and sees them drinking alcohol. So there are, um, for those of M Muslims who, I mean, because they adhere to the ideology more, we're talking about a larger sample there, um, it's, it's not an easy job. I mean, that, that's why I think that to get out of the theology part and, and, and try to reach Muslims as a human being. So we have to have a more humane or humanity approach uh, is that try to more appeal to their feelings than appeal to their theology. Because I have many doubts whether Islamic information can exist, succeed or uh, whether there is a compatibility between liberal secular values and the Quran. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's even possible with the other religions. But... Um, so I think that if we just push that as the, as the, we appeal to the Muslims' humanity versus appealing to their theology, I think that's, in that way, uh, and we show, I mean, that's where propaganda works, right? It's like you, you try to appeal to, she like show them women being enslaved uh, by ISIS and tell them, okay, is this really the life that you want to live? Is this the, even, the, and some of the values come from the hadith and stuff, so, um, does this appeal to you? Does this something that you want to want? And, and I think most Muslims will answer no to that question, which is good. Uh, so if we keep pushing for that narrative of hum humane messaging, it's better for us than to discuss the theology. Um, I suppose this is a second question. I forgot, sorry. Well, I think, I think back at the time, I mean, Catholicism and Christianity created a lot more damage than the Ottoman Empire. And, and this. Uh, so, um, yes, I mean, I, I think that back at the time, it makes sense that... Four minutes? No, I have a question. Um, yeah, so like... <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, I think that, I mean, I, I mean, if you look at data, I mean, look at, for example, Nazism and white supremacy, um, and, and have killed much more people than Islamic extremism did. So I think that at the time, and communism killed much more people than Nazis did, even though I don't know why communists get a free pass, um, is that people mostly focus on Hitler but forget about Stalin, who actually killed more people and Mao and uh, people like them. So uh, I think back at the time, I think someone can make the argument that in the 20s and even the 40s during World War II, ideologies like Nazism and communism and fascism created much more damage to the world and killed much more people than Islam, even at the moment. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think Hitchens' assessment is wrong. Compa I think in the 21st century, we have an issue with Islam. Uh, I mean, not that Islam used to be great before, but it is by comparison to other religions in the 21st century, it is, in my opinion, uh, is on the 
most of the violent ones. Um, but in the 20th century, I think somebody can make the argument that other ideologies are more. Um, so I think a useful tool here for a lot of the people in the room who are students who want to advocate for things like human rights and making pro-liberty arguments, appealing to people's humanity is certainly a great strategy. But I mean, how do you, this is a question maybe in terms of strategy of distancing from the crazies and the bigots. Yeah. How do you appeal to people's humanity when it's viewed that people like Ann Coulter or Gar Wilders are allies when they're not? They're very anti-liberty. So how do we appeal to people's humanity and, and, uh, and distance ourselves from people who are also critical of other ideas that, yeah. that harm human rights? Well, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned, I, mean, I don't consider people like Gary Wilders to be allies. Uh, and I don't consider many of the people on the far right to be allies in this uh, battle. So I think that, I mean, just by pushing a human rights, secular-oriented messaging, we've already excluded the far right because they don't believe. I mean, first of all, when you are appealing to Muslims and humanity, you are acknowledging that Muslims are human, right? So with the people who are bigoted, they don't even acknowledge this. this, this uh, I mean, if you go to some of the forums that some of these individuals are popular, um, you, you see a lot of hateful terms against Muslims as people, uh, dehumanizing terms. Um, so I think that we definitely need to distance ourselves. Uh, um, I mean, without doing, I mean, there's people who are doing kind of, I think, overcompensation, right? Because they don't want to sound like the far right. So they, sometimes, I mean, some of my friends, they like have to criticize everything Trump does just to show that they are not racist or something like that. Uh, and, and I think this is kind of overcompensation. It's like you have to constantly criticize Trump just to show you are the good guy. But at the same time, uh, you, you, made it, you make it very clear that you are against the bigotry that some of these individuals hold. And I think that if we push this, I mean, many of these individuals don't even believe in, believe in secularism. Many of them are Christian theocrats or, or believe in a form of racial supremacy. So, the, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't think these people are allies. So we need to, I think by our messaging, we can make it clear that these people are not our allies. One more question. We have to have a person of color. So the one over there. <laughs> Sorry, we have, a, we have a quota system over here. <laughs> Affirmative action. Who supports that, right? Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Noman. I'm a Muslim from Pakistan. And I uh, just want to you know, piggyback on the remarks that you, that you, you referred to the analogy of you know, people comparing Islam with other religions and you know, people saying that both are equally bad. You don't agree with that. Uh, and you know that's that's true. You know, I think we see a lot more violence, you know, committed in the name of Islam in the 21st century. But uh, part of the reason for that is uh, is the coverage that Islam receives in the media. Uh, for instance, let me ask you. I mean, Islam always gets the, the a bad peer in the media, right? Because let me ask you as a question. Uh, I think a show of hands. How many people have heard of uh, you know uh, Muslim terrorists or ISIS? Everybody, almost everybody, right? Uh, let me ask you guys this now. How many people have heard of, uh, you know, the genocide that's been committed against Muslims in, the, in Myanmar by Buddhist monks? All right, so about half, right? A lot, a lot more or less people. So it also has to do with the coverage that's received by Islam, the bad PR, you know, the stereotypes that's been uh, consistently been perpetuated. And also don't agree with one remark that you made. You said Obama is... He should be the perfect Muslim because his daughters go to uh, college, right? Uh, these I, are my, I was making that sarcastically, but, uh, uh, but anyway, well, but by by doing that, you're per perpetuating the stereotypes that already exist in in the media. Uh, these are my two friends here. They're both from Pakistan. One's a surgeon, the other one's a dentist. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that you, uh, I think that the first first one is fake news. Okay, the compared to other religions, right now. Yes, other religions commit crime. Nobody's denying that there is other crimes. But compared to other religions at the moment, 21st century at the moment, crimes committed in the name of Islam make up the majority. As to acts of terrorism, not acts of state action. In case with the Bruma, it's actually much more complicated than just Muslims versus Buddhists getting killed. It's actually, there's a lot of nationalistic, tribal hatred. So, yeah, I mean, I, the, the, Jobs thing is actually more sarcastic, but even though there is a lot of m more data driven, I mean, giving anecdotal examples is not data. I mean, I can say that, oh, I have two Muslim friends who are members of Al Qaeda, therefore all Muslims are terrorists. I mean, this is anecdotal evidence, so it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think the first one for those who are interested in, interested in data, 
Um, if you look at the crimes committed by terrorist groups, it's more in Islam and than other religions. That doesn't mean other religions are all peaceful and hippies. It just means that Islam is number one in terms of acts of terrorism. Thank you very much. Well, thank goodness. I mean, I mean. By the way, just one, one comment. Uh, for those students, if you are, I mean, you mentioned about students getting involved. I do have a list here for those who, because we're trying to start a campus program. So we believe free speech. If you guys are interested in joining, you can just write in your name and your email, and maybe we can contact you soon. Inshallah. Yep. Okay. Take care. All right. Thanks, everybody. We have a 15-minute break, and uh, we will come back for Fleming Rose.
Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Our next speaker is Fleming Rose, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a well-known journalist and author. Uh, Mr. Rose is a frequent contributor to international media. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Newsweek, The New Yorker, The Die Welt, Der Spiegel, El Pai, Huffington Post, The Guardian, The Daily Mail, and even more. In 2016, Mr. Rose was, Mr. Rose was awarded the prestigious Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty. Mr. Rose has been a lecturer and speaker all over the world. He is the author of several books, such as The, Tyr the Tyranny of Silence, How One Cartoon Ignited a Global Debate on the Future of Free Speech. Um, in, in English, wait, oh, there's actually a whole thing in there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, in 2014, it was listed actually among the top 10 best nonfiction books uh, by The uh, Economist. Uh, Hymn to Freedom and The Possessed uh, are a couple other of his uh, pieces of literature, which uh, Mr. Rose recently received the uh, Weekend Davidson's Literary, literary Prize. Uh, Mr. Rose has spent 14 years abroad as a foreign correspondent in Moscow uh, and Washington, D.C. In 2004, he returned to Denmark to become the culture and later foreign editor of Jillian Poston's, uh, of Jillian's Poston, that's a Denmark's leading newspaper. Uh, Mr. Rose uh, graduated in Russian language and literature from the University of Copenhagen, and he worked as a translator of Russian literature before he became a journalist. So welcome, Fleming Rose. Thank you uh, for those kind words of introduction and welcome. Um, I'm happy to be here, even though it was a long, long flight from Copenhagen. Um, but uh, it's important, I think, to uh, talk about the issues uh, that I care about uh, to an audience like you. Um, Usually I don't talk about the cartoons, in fact, because I'm quite fed up <laughs> talking about them. But uh, I've experienced every now and then when I don't do it uh, in the Q&A and the critical questions afterwards, uh, it appears that people, in fact, don't know the facts, what actually happened and what was the reasoning behind the cartoons and so on and so forth. So I'm going to talk about uh, the cartoons today, and uh, um, I will start out by saying a few words about the meter level, um, what I learned about um, the framework for the debate about free speech in today's world from the cartoon crisis, and uh, then I'll talk about the cartoons, and then in the end I will try to sum up a few things and uh, suggest to you uh, what might be um, the way forward uh, defending uh, freedom of expression and even the right to publish uh, cartoons like these that uh, appear to be offensive to, uh, to a lot of people and why it matters to defend even speech that uh, a lot of people feel is uh, offensive. But first, a few words about uh, the kind of world we are living in today that has changed the way we, de we debate and talk about free speech. I mean, free speech has been controversial all throughout history, all the way back to uh, Athens. Uh, and it has, for most of the time, in fact, been in bad standing. It is increasingly in bad standing today, but uh, nevertheless, we live in one of the better times for free speech. Uh, but compared to, let's say, 10, 20 years ago, things are getting worse. But they are not as worse as they were in the beginning of the 20th century or even uh, further back in, uh, in, in history. But uh, two new factors are driving the discussion about free speech that it really has transformed uh, the debate about free speech and the limitations necessary um, um, to impose on uh, speech. Uh, the first factor is the digital technology. The fact that what, what is being published somewhere 
is immediately being published everywhere. Um, if you take the cartoons um, and a small town in Pakistan or Afghanistan and you go back 30, 40 years, uh, a town maybe with 500,000 people somewhere in Central uh, East Asia, um, the inhabitants of that town would throughout their whole life maybe only encounter 500,000 people, and they would not know what was going on uh, 500 kilometers away. Uh, due to the techni uh, digital technology, they now know what is going on five to 10,000 kilometers away. And even though they sometimes cannot read and write, they are even, even able to uh, express themselves politically vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the cartoons, for instance. Uh, this digital technology is wonderful in most ways, but it, 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 uh, it creates a global uh, public space that, uh, that implies uh, or enhances the, the, uh, the risk of misunderstandings. Because when information travels, it loses context. Uh, and when the cartoons traveled back in 2005 and 2006, uh, the context was lost. And the digital technology and the loss of context also uh, provides a lot of opportunities to politicians that want to manipulate information. That is also what happened uh, in this case, and I will come back to that when I talk about the cartoons. So the one factor is the digital technology that really transform uh, the framework of uh, the debate about free speech and its limits. The other factor is migration. Uh, the fact that people are moving across borders in numbers and at a speed never seen before in the history of mankind. And the implication of this is that most societies in the world are getting more and more diverse in terms of culture ethnicity and religion. That goes for the US. You have been a more diverse society than most societies in the world, but even Denmark, that used to be a quite homogeneous society, is now getting more and more diverse. It's the same all over Europe, same in Russia, same in other parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, so the combination of the digital technology and migration ha has multiplied uh, the kind of diversity that we have to cope with in, uh, in our daily lives. Uh, the British historian uh, Timothy Gard Nash, who recently wrote a good book on free speech, I can recommend it, calls, call, uh, uh, labels this cosmopolis, that we are increasingly, everybody are living in a cosmopolis. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, a Canadian-born um, professor on media, 40 years ago, talked about the global village. Uh, but that's, in fact, not the right concept because what characterizes a village is the homogeneity of the population. They are usually all peasants. And then you have a teacher and a priest. But, uh, and and they, all, uh, they all believe in the same God. Uh, but we are, I think it was in 2014, uh, more people... Uh, on the planet are living in cities than in, uh, in the countryside. And this trend will just increase as we move out throughout the 21st century. So, so diversity is here to stay. And, and uh, I think this debate and uh, in general the debate about free speech is in fact about our ability to manage diversity. Diversity of cultures, diversity of uh, religion, diversity of opinions, and so on and so forth. And, and quite often we don't recognize that diversity is painful or can be very painful. It's not easy. Uh, and, 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 and free speech is not uh, some kind of holy uh, mixture that can solve all, all our problems. I mean, I believe in free speech uh, and uh, 
I have paid a price for standing up for it, but I also, I'm also aware of the fact that uh, free speech, uh, defending the right to, for, peop to, to, uh, for people to say what they believe, uh, sometimes causes severe pain to other people. Um, but the point here is that the alternative is just far worse. Um, so so um, we have these two factors, um, migration and the digital uh, uh, technology that uh, has created this new cosmopolis where the challenge is that we have to manage diversity, how we do that without compromising fundamental freedoms and values like freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is the bigger picture. Uh, then let's move on to this uh, specific case uh, that I was involved in. Uh, wow, it's... Uh, it's almost uh, 12 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. So when this happened, most of you were, in fact, uh, not even in school, I guess. Uh, um, the starting point for the publication of those 12 cartoons of uh, the Prophet Muhammad was a children's book uh, that was about to be to being published in Denmark, um, and the writer of that book um, went public in late summer 2005, telling the Danish wire service uh, that I am writing this book about the life of the prophet for children, but I have had problems finding an illustrator for the book. Uh, in Denmark as in the United States uh, and as in most other countries, when you write for children, you need illustrations of the main character. And this was a book about the life of the prophet and therefore uh, the writer, of course, wanted illustrations of the main character. According to him, uh, he had approached several illustrators and uh, some of them had said, no, thank you. Uh, and he believed it was because they were afraid of what might happen to them. And the one who, in fact, accepted the invitation to the job and did the illustrations insisted on anonymity. He did not want to have his name on the cover of that book, which is common practice. And we later learned that the reason for that, in fact, was fear. And uh, this illustrator referred to two examples. One was uh, Salman Rushdie, the uh, Indian-born uh, British ex-Muslim writer who uh, received a fatwa in 1989 from Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, the head of uh, Iran at that time, for a novel he wrote, The Satanic Verses, that uh, satirizes uh, parts of uh, the life of the prophet. And the other example he referred to was uh, Theo van Gogh, a Dutch filmmaker who was killed on the streets of Amsterdam, I think November 1st, 2004, because he had done a documentary um, about uh, violence against women within Muslim communities being justified with quotations uh, from the Quran. Um, and by the way, uh, the young Muslim who killed Van Gogh uh, later in uh, court said to, his, to Van Gogh's mother, I did not kill your uh, son because I felt marginalized as representative of the Moroccan minority. I did not kill your son because I couldn't get a job or because people were talking um, negatively about uh, Islam. I killed your son because my religion t uh, told me to do it. And, and if my father had done the same as Van Gogh had done uh, with the Quran and the Prophet, I would also have killed him. So this is just a reference to the point that Faisal may, may, uh, made, uh, I agree with, that this is in fact a battle of ideas. 
uh, like the fight against uh, uh, communist, the communist Soviet Union also was a battle of ideas. Um, yes, so, so, uh, so this story about uh, uh, the children's writer uh, who couldn't find an illustrator for uh, his book about the prophet and the illustrators who said no, it was on the front page of uh, almost all Danish newspapers, I think, September 17th, 2005. And there was a discussion uh, among uh, cartoonists, about, among writers, among translators, about, um, among artists, whether there is self-censorship uh, uh, when it comes to Islam or whether or not. Uh, and, and it was a big story, uh, a big national story. And uh, this was on a Saturday. And on Monday, uh, September 19th, 2005, um, we had an editorial meeting at the newspaper where I used to work back then, Jyllandsposten, and we were discussing how we could follow up on this story. And back then, we didn't know that, in fact, uh, some of the illustrators uh, uh, were afraid of taking on the job because we had only this one source, uh, the children's writer. Uh, uh, so there also was a discussion whether, I mean, is he telling the truth or is this just a PR stunt or, or what is it? And, and, uh, and during that uh, discussion about how to follow up on this story, a reporter suggested, you know, why don't we invite uh, cartoonists uh, to uh, draw the profit? Then we find out whether there is self-censorship or not. And that idea landed on my table. Um, and uh, that same evening, I wrote a letter to all members of the uh, Danish Cartoonist Association, inviting them to uh, draw the prophet as they see him. I did not invite them to mock the prophet. I did not invite them to satirize the prophet. Uh, it was a very open invitation, because it was not a question of mocking Islam, it was a question of whether Danish illustrators submitted themselves to an Islamic taboo, even though they were not Muslims. Um, so I received 12 cartoons. Um, but when I received the cartoons, we started a debate inside the paper whether we had, whether it was uh, worth while publishing, whether we had not evidence for uh, this angle on the story, and, and so on and so forth. And while we had this internal debate, five, six things happened in, uh, in Denmark and in Western Europe that convinced me and the editors that this was a legitimate new, new story and we had to publish the cartoons. First, there was a story from London, uh, Tate Gallery, the big national museum in, uh, in London, had a retrospective exhibition uh, by um, a avant-gardist artist by the name John Leifang. And in that exhibition, there was an installation called God is Great. And this ins installation consisted of uh, a copy of the Bible, of the Talmud, and of the Quran. And, and, and they were all torn into pieces and layered in a piece of glass. And this is in the aftermath of the 7-7 uh, bombings in, in London. We had to take that um, into consideration. That was the context. Uh, and the museum director decided to remove that installation from the exhibition without asking the artist and without asking the curator. And uh, the police also didn't ask the Muslims in London or the Jews or the Christians if they were offended by this installation. So, it was another example of self-censorship. Um, you do not say uh, certain things because you are afraid of, my, of what might happen if you do it. Um, similarly, there was an, exhibi an exhibition in Gothenburg, Sweden, where an Algerian-born female artist had made a painting of a man and a woman naked having sex. And on top of the painting was the first uh, verse from the Quran. Um, and uh, that 
painting was in fact exhibited uh, in the museum. But a lot of uh, Muslims started to call the museum and complain that uh, this uh, painting was exhibited. Uh, and the museum director removed uh, the painting, uh, again without asking the artist and without asking the curator. And in fact, the removal of the painting triggered a counter demonstration by a female artist from Iran who had fled a theocratic dictatorship to uh, be a free artist in, uh, in Sweden. And uh, interestingly enough, her counter demonstration didn't have any, sorry, didn't have any effect. Um, but uh, today I probably know why. Um, she didn't threaten to commit violence or intimidate uh, anyone. She just expressed her um, individual opinion. Um, and uh, so that was two more examples of, uh, of self-censorship. Then a Danish stand-up comedian uh, was very popular in Denmark. Uh, he gave an interview to my newspaper in which he said, you know, I have no uh, problems um, mocking the Bible in front of a camera, but uh, I dare not do the same with the Quran. And it really annoys me, but uh, it's a fact of life. So this stand-up comedian was in fact making a difference between Christianity and Islam in the way he would uh, ridicule and satirize. Uh, so that was the fourth example of, uh, of self-censorship. And then uh, in Western Europe, uh, this all happened within the course of one or two weeks uh, in the middle of September 2005. Then uh, Ayan Hirshi Ali, uh, the Somalia-born former Dutch politician who now resides in the US um, and who is a former Muslim, uh, published a book of essays in several Western European countries. And uh, it turned out that some of the translators of her book also didn't want to have their names on the cover standing next to her name. And in the Finnish edition, they even censored, they cut out a phrase uh, that was critical of the Prophet Muhammad without consulting Ayan. So they were, Ayan, they were, they were censoring her text without asking her. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, there was a meeting in Copenhagen between the Danish Prime Minister and a group of uh, Danish Imams uh, how, to, um, how to counter radicalization of, uh, of, of Muslims in the aftermath of the 7-7 bombings in, uh, in London. And in that meeting, two of the Imams called on the Danish Prime Minister to use his influence to get more positive coverage of uh, Islam in the Danish press. And they also called for the passing of uh, new laws that would criminalize um, criticism of, uh, of uh, Islam. That was, in fact, a call for censorship, a call for using the tools of state power to get a specific point of view into the press. And all this happened within the course of 10 days in September 2005, all speaking to the same problem of self-censorship um, and the discrimination when it comes to uh, treatment of uh, Islam in the public domain, in uh, art galleries, movies, books, comedy shows, and so on and so forth. And all, all that convinced me that this is just not a single um, example with the children's book that we really have a story with a lot of examples and therefore we have to publish uh, those cartoons and then I wrote this short text um, laying out uh, the rationale behind uh, um, uh, the publication and they were published September 30th uh, um, 2005 and uh, the first day, uh, I received one phone call 
from a newspaper vendor outside Copenhagen who uh, called me up and said, you know, I, w I went to the mosque today and we had a conversation and uh, I don't want to sell you a newspaper anymore because of uh, this page. And in fact, uh, I didn't pay that much uh, attention because as an editor you receive these calls every now and then. People complain about things in the paper and they unsubscribe uh, and then they subscribe later again and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, I think it was in a, in a week or two there was the first demonstration by Muslims in, uh, in Copenhagen. I also had to say, and back then I didn't know uh, that uh, to many Muslims uh, it's a taboo to uh, depict uh, uh, the Prophet. Even though there is in fact no textual foundation in the Quran for this ban, that which most Muslims in fact don't know. Uh, and if you go to, uh, uh, in Copenhagen we have an art collection with um, old Islamic art and there you can see depictions of the prophet from uh, the 14th century, in fact. Um, so this, and, and if you go to Iran, you will also see within the Shia tra tradition uh, depictions of uh, the prophet. It's not a taboo like it is to, uh, to many uh, Sunni Muslims. I didn't know all that uh, back then, um, but uh, that's, that's another story. Um, um, so, was it okay to do this? Uh, uh, how do I look uh, back on this episode today uh, with all the things that happened? Uh, and, and to me, it still makes sense um, from the point of view of an editor. Um, you, you, for a journalist, you, you hear about a problem in this sense that there is self-censorship when it comes to uh, covering Islam in one way or the other. And you want to know, uh, and you want to find out if it's true or not. And you can do that in many ways. You can call people, you can do uh, surveys, uh, um, you can do many things. But you can also ask people to demonstrate their relationship to this Islamic taboo in action, which we did which it's not my idea, and therefore I can say I think it's, it's, it, it was a very original and creative idea. We have this principle in journalism, don't tell, show. And this is a very good example of uh, don't tell, show. Don't, don't use a lot of words, demonstrate in practice what this is about, and uh, um, yeah. Um, and I would also say that uh, there's a lot of people who, you know, believe that this was an act of mockery of a weak minority and uh, uh, Muslims in Denmark were having a hard time already, so why do this and so on and so forth. And I would, I would rather turn this around and phrase it another way. I, uh, I believe that you can see this as an integration project, as a project of integrating Danish Muslims into a long hold tradition of religious satire. Um, this is in no way transgressing what uh, cartoonists are doing with uh, Christianity and uh, Jesus Christ. So, so by doing that, we, are, we in fact communicated to uh, Muslims in Denmark, you know, you don't have to accept less, you don't have to accept more, but you have to accept exactly the same as every other group and individual in our society. And in that lies uh, an act of recognition that you are part of our community. You are not guests that need some kind of special treatment. You are not strangers. Uh, uh, you are here to stay and, and therefore we, we, we will treat you equally. Um, I understand that uh, a lot of people don't see it that way, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a fair point. Um, yeah, uh, and back then, uh, I think I was pondering two questions. 
uh, when I commissioned those cartoons. One was, is there self-censorship when it comes to dealing with Islam in Western Europe and in the West in general? Because some people were saying there is no self-censorship, others were saying, yes, there is self-censorship. Uh, so that was an open question. And uh, the other question was, if there is self-censorship, is the self-censorship based in reality, or is it just a sick um, fantasy of uh, the people who are submitting themselves to, to, uh, to self-censorship because they are afraid of something um, strange, but in, in fact, uh, 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 if you challenge Islam in one way or the other, it does not have any consequences. And, and today, we can say for sure that uh, the answer to both questions is yes. There is self-censorship. Nobody publishes those cartoons anymore in uh, Western Europe, not to speak of the United States. You didn't even publish them in the first place um, at a time when they were, in fact, uh, newsworthy. I mean, it reads on the top of the New York Times, all the news that fit to print. Uh, February 1st, this was the main story in the world. And, and why not trust your readers' ability to make adjustment for themselves? Uh, in fact, I received a lot of mails from people here at the height of the cartoon crisis. Where can we see the cartoons? Nobody is publishing them in the US. And I directed them or sent them a PDF. And then they got back to me and said, oh, is it just that? So, so by, by, by not publishing, you in fact reinforce the perception that this is really, really bad. Um, the most controversial, yeah, I, I would also say that, that uh, a, a lot of people criticized us for uh, stereotyping uh, and demonizing uh, Islam and Muslims. But if you look at all the 12 cartoons, only four of them, in fact, depicts a prophet. And this one is, in fact, mocking me. Uh, because this is a pupil in uh, third grade, Muhammad. And it reads on the blackboard in uh, Persian that uh, the cultural um, department of Yulan's persons is a bunch of reactionary provocateurs. Uh, and and this, was, this one is, in fact, a lineup. Uh, um, and it depicts the most anti-Muslim politician in uh, Denmark as if she is a criminal. Um, and this makes fun of the uh, children's writer. It reads a PR stunt. So mocking him for making this up to sell more books. Um, so, so in fact, uh, um, the cartoons are very different, both in whom is the target for satire and the way the prophet is depicted. This is a very neutral reportage uh, uh, drawing. Uh, not, it, it's not even satire. Um, and a Danish documentarist, uh, in the aftermath of the crisis, uh, he, um, he did a, a documentary for broadcasting stations all over the world. Uh, so he had a lot of money to do this documentary. And he went to Iran, and he found he found the instigator behind the demonstrations in front of the Danish embassy in uh, February 2006. Uh, and he visited him at home. And uh, in, in the end, at the end of the conversation, he asked him, do you want to see the cartoons? Because he had never seen them. Um, he said, yes, yes. Uh, and then he sh showed him the most controversial cartoon uh, of uh, the prophet with a bomb in his turban. And this uh, Iranian Muslim got very upset, but not by the bomb or the Shahida or the first uh, verse from the Quran. He said, why does Muhammad look like a Sikh <laughs> and not like an Arab? So, so, so the sense of offense and insult, in fact, is in the eye of the beholder. A cartoon and an image is never offensive in and by itself. 
uh, it changes uh, across cultures and it changes across time. If you take, if you take Edouard Manis's um, uh, fantastic painting, uh, Lunch on the Green Grass, it's in the Dorset in, uh, in Paris, uh, where you have a naked woman lying on the grass and you have two men sitting and watching her. Today, that looks like the most harmonious, uh, beautiful uh, uh, painting. But in, when it was first exhibited in Paris in 1865, uh, some of the viewers tried to destroy it with knives because they felt very insulted by the fact that a naked woman, uh, without being shy, just watched the painter in the eye. Uh, and that was perceived as very vulgar and uh, challenging and, uh, and provocative. Um, yeah. So, for how long did I talk? Mm. I still have uh, five minutes before, two minutes before uh, Q&A? Okay. Uh, uh, just to get back to my initial question, um, how do we manage uh, uh, this diversity of uh, religion, culture, and opinion in a world where we are getting more and more multicultural and where we have this digital technology? And, and basically, I think there are two ways you can go. You can say either, if you accept my taboo, I'll accept yours. If, if you do not publish cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, it should also not be allowed to publish cartoons of Jesus or of, uh, of Buddha or of Shiva goddesses uh, and so on and so forth. And if you want to be consistent, uh, this should also go for secular gods. Uh, which means that it should also be a criminal offense to publish uh, cartoons of uh, Karl Marx or Milton Friedman, can I say, as uh, somebody uh, who had a relationship with him. Um, and uh, if it's a criminal offense to publish cartoons of religious figures, then it should also be a criminal offense to uh, deny the Holocaust, to deny the Armenian Holocaust, uh, to, uh, Armenian genocide, uh, the crimes of communism in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And even though I don't invite people to offend one another, I don't like offending other people. I try to be polite and, uh, and, and civil. I just have to accept that from time to time you may say things, especially in a world of diversity that other people find offensive because the more different you get, uh, the more different people will understand things and express uh, 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 them, themselves. Uh, and it sounds very nice on the surface, you know, if you accept my taboo, I'll accept yours, and then we'll live in peace. The problem is, especially when we are living in a time of this grievance fundamentalism, and where people are uh, throwing around emotional capital, uh, it's very easy to play the offense card. Uh, even if you're not offended, but you just don't like what the other person says. And then you can say, well, I'm very offended by what you say. It hurts my feelings, so please shut up. Uh, and then you will end uh, in a tyranny of silence. In the end, uh, especially when we are so diverse and there are very different thresholds of what we feel is uh, offensive, um, uh, nobody in the end can say anything without somebody out there being offended by what is being said. And therefore, nothing can be said if we accept this notion, if you accept my taboo, if you accept not talking about what is sensitive to me, I will also not talking about what is sensitive to you. Uh, so I think that is the wrong way to go, even though it sounds nice uh, on the surface. The other way to go is to ask ourselves, what are the minimal limitations that we need on speech in order to be able to live together in peace? And to me, the key limitation is incitement to violence. Nobody should have the right to uh, say, go out and kill all Muslims, or go out and kill those with red hairs, and so on and so forth. That, that, that is a crucial uh, uh, limitation. Uh, I also think that people do have a right to privacy, that the media do not have a right to publish everything about our private lives, and I'm also in fact uh, in favor of a narrowly defined, uh, defined libel law. 
that if you, if, you, if you say nasty things about other people, lying about their reputation, it should be possible to take you to court and, and you, will, you, will, you, you should be able to prove what you're saying. And if you cannot prove it, uh, it should have some consequences. But, but apart from these three limitations, I, uh, I think um, uh, people should have a right to say whatever they want. And of course, this is not easy. This is very difficult because it implies that, that we will suffer pain from time to time because people are saying uh, things that we don't like and that we feel uh, are hurtful. But I have one modest recommendation um, to find a way out of this. Uh, in Europe, I don't know if that's the case in the United States, but I suppose so, that, uh, that, that if you are a public official uh, and uh, you offend your customer or clients, uh, police officers, doctors, uh, teachers, so on and so forth, you can be uh, sent to uh, sensitivity training in order to learn how to behave. But I would suggest that we all are being sent to insensitivity training because we need thicker skins if, uh, if, we, if we shall be able to live in this very diverse world uh, without shutting down uh, free speech. Okay, thank you. Let me stop here and take your questions. Uh, I have more to say. So we're going to do some questions. We have a mic so that, uh, that everyone can hear and it can pull through for the video. For your questions, please make them brief. Uh, make them, uh, don't, don't make statements, uh, just so that we can get to as many people as possible. So if you have a question, just put your hand up. Uh, uh, at the beginning, you basically laid out the events up until the uh, the cartoon uh, issue. Do you think something like this was inevitable? Like there was going to be some uh, poor uh, journalistic sap who who stumbled upon it uh, with, without meaning to and, and caused this whole other incident somewhere else? And then a second question, which uh, to break you from uh, your talk about the cartoons, uh, what is your favorite uh, book of Ru Russian literature? Because I know that's something you're interested in. Yeah. Um, my favorite book of Russian literature, I think, is uh, Mikhail Bukakov's uh, The Master and uh, Margarita. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know it, but... Um, great book. Great book, yes. Um, and um, I lived, in fact, in Moscow in the same quarter where the master is uh, walking around. So, um, yeah, it's close to my heart. Uh, uh, was it inevitable? Yes, I think so. Uh, if it hadn't been the cartoons, uh, something and, and another incident would have ignited uh, this kind of confrontation and uh, and and debate. And and I didn't talk about this, but if you what happened afterwards, I mean the the the, the, the reasons why it became a global crisis had very little to do with the cartoons, but it had more to do with domestic political situations in Egypt, in Pakistan, the Palestinian territories, and Iran, where, 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 where groups uh, exploited the cartoons to present themselves as true defenders of, uh, of the prophet. Uh, and if they hadn't had an election in Egypt and the Palestinian territories, if they hadn't had a hike in sugar prices in Pakistan, uh, maybe it would never have become a, a, a global crisis. Um, but yes, I think it was invisible. In, in and I would say, you know, it, 12 years ago, a lot of people accused me of inventing a crisis. And very few pe people do that today because we have cartoon crises every day almost. And there has been so many clashes and confrontations. So, so, I think we have, to, we have really to think about uh, uh, how to manage these kind of situations. And, um, and, and to me, uh, the key concept that we have to educate ourselves in is tolerance. Uh, tolerance not meaning you know, to be kind uh, or to turning the other cheek when people say something. 
uh, nasty. But tolerance in the sense that we learn to live with things that we hate, that we actively dislike without using violence, threats and intimidation and bans to shut it down. And that is very difficult. It's not something in a human. I believe that every human, all human beings, they do have an instinct to be free. You want to decide for yourself how you live your life. But, but, but being tolerant is very uh, demetrial to human nature because you, you don't like to live with things that, uh, that you hate. You, want, you spit it out when you eat it or you close the door and you don't want to listen, you turn off your TV and so on and so forth. So, 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 so tolerance is, to me, uh, the key thing that we have to uh, teach our children and we have to, to learn. And, and, and every generation has to, to, uh, to learn this by themselves. Unfortunately, we have lost uh, the sense of what toleration, in fact, implies. And many people believe that there is a tension between freedom and tolerance. And historically, freedom and tolerance are, in fact, two sides of the same coin. There can be no freedom, no, no right to express very uh, different point of views without tolerance. And tolerance is just meaningless if it doesn't imply that you have to live with things that you don't like or listen to things that you don't like. Yeah. Uh, so this question is specifically about your uh, thoughts about free speech. Uh, the latitude, does it ex extend to historical facts versus just ideas because specifically Holocaust denialism because the Iranian state, uh, you know, state will take that and use that as an instrument of propaganda against Jews, uh, you know, all over the Middle East. So where do you, uh, on what side of the debate are you between just uh, free speech in terms of ideas versus historical facts? Um, I, I, I don't think that any democracy should uh, criminalize ideas. And I don't think any democracy should uh, pass laws um, uh, legitimizing only certain versions of history. Even though uh, when it comes to the Holocaust, we all know it happened. We all know that it's offensive to a lot of people to deny the Holocaust. But I don't think that the right way to go is to, uh, to criminalize Holocaust denial. I don't think it's very effective. I have not heard of any human beings who have changed their minds just because their ideas have been banned. Um, and and if, if you look at Europe right now, uh, we, we receive a lot of Muslims who are Holocaust deniers. I mean, they have been taught in Syrian schools or in other schools, e Egyptian schools, that, uh, that the Holocaust was the invention of uh, the Jews. Um, and if, if, if they are not allowed to air these stupid and outrageous opinions, uh, there is no way that we can challenge them. Uh, so it's, I think it's very, very important that, uh, that we do not criminalize. Uh, and I, you know, when I wrote my book, The Tyranny of Silence, because I was quite often confronted with, you know, these cartoons are like uh, anti-Semitic cartoons in the 20s and 30s. So I read about the Holocaust, about, about laws, and it turns out that all Holocaust denial laws in Europe, they were passed after the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, I thought it might have happened in the 60s, 50s, when people were really afraid that if you're allowed to deny it, we, need a, we risk a repetition of the Holocaust. But after the fall of the Berlin Wall, I don't think that was, you know, a big risk. Um, and, 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 and the thing that people don't know uh, is that somebody talked about Weimar Germany um, and... Um, it was rightly stated that may, that may be uh, not the right analogy, analogy today, but it turns out, in fact, that in Weimar Germany, there were hate speech laws defending Jews. And if you take some of the key Nazi figures like, uh, like Josef Goebbels, uh, the propaganda minister for uh, Hitler, he uh, was convict, convicted uh, several times in, uh, in civil cases uh, against the Jewish vice police director of Berlin, Bernhard Weiss. And uh, the editor of Der Stürmer, um, uh, I forgot his name, but uh, he, he went to jail twice. And, uh, and his magazine was confiscated and taken to court, I think, 36 times over the course of 10 years. 
So there were, in fact, uh, laws in the books in Weimar Germany um, trying to rein in hate speech. Uh, and that's, I think, that is maybe the only example in history where you could justify these kind of laws if they were effective. But even then, it didn't, uh, it didn't work. Uh, and I don't believe that the best way to fight uh, the emotions and aggression uh, behind um, uh, xenophobia is to criminalize it. It's very ineffective. Uh, what were you thinking and feeling during the Charlie Hebdo massacres? Oh, um, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, that was terrible. Um, I, I mean, it was maybe the first, the worst day of my working life, uh, January 7, 2015, because I knew these people. I appeared as a witness in the court case against them in 2009, and I had a, I had a project with one of them, and I appeared on panels uh, with some of them. Uh, um, <clears throat> and in a way, you know, Charlie Hebdo started publishing cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad after our case. So we had this very intimate uh, personal relationship, which in a way was very beautiful in the sense that the newspaper I used to work for was center right, while Charlie Hebdo is on the left. And, but we agreed on the principles, which I think is, is I mean, free speech about, is not about whether you're on the right or on the left. It's about principles of a liberal democracy. Um, yeah, but, but I would say uh, I was not surprised. Uh, I think it was, it was just a question of time. But, uh, but when something like that happened, you are always uh, shocked. Um, yeah, it was a terrible thing. Hi. So um, I was wondering, uh, you were talking about before that the best way um, to uh, kind of uh, counter. to counter these sort of narratives that are clearly wrong is, uh, you know, through a battle of ideas and discussions. So um, this is a little bit esoteric, but uh, what would you say uh, about a situation uh, like North Korea, where North Korea actively says that, well, America is still trying to imperialize the entire world and like they, the country itself, it's not just like a law, it's they as a country believe that this thing that's happening is, or th this thing that's not happening in the least is, is still happening. So how do we um, counter things like that, 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 a, that a country believes? Uh, can we use the same techniques that you're talking about or is that? <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend it, and I, 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 I don't think uh, people in North Korea are having, are enjoying their lives, and it's only a question of time where you know things there will turn very badly. I think. No, and I, I think this is a little bit into the deep debate about fake news. Um, uh, there was somebody from Germany uh, up here. I noticed, and Germany is in, in fact in the vanguard in Europe against free speech right now. Uh, because of their history, that's very understandable. Um, uh, but, but I just don't think it's the right way to go about it. There is a law pending in the German parliament. They want to criminalize distribution of false information. Uh, and they want to uh, impose fines up to, I think it's 50 million, dollar, 50 million euros which is a huge sum of money to Facebook and Google and uh, Twitter if they don't take it down immediately. And for someone uh, like me who lived in the Soviet Union, it just, you know, it shivers down my spine when, uh, when, uh, when, when a liberal democracy wants to introduce a law where it is the state that is defining what is false information and what is not. Uh, I had a lot of friends in the dissident movement in the Soviet Union who went to labor camps and prison and exile, and they were all convicted for disseminating deliberate false information about the nature of the Soviet uh, communist system. And when the, when the German Minister of Justice, Heiko Maas, proposed this law, he used exactly the same 
phraseology without acknowledging, uh, I think, what he was saying. So, so uh, I, I think uh, fake news or false information is a huge problem. I don't want to, uh, to minimize it, but I just don't think we, that we should use the law uh, to fight it. We need to, we, we need to reconquer the fundamental principles of enlightenment, uh, that you check information, uh, and no one has a final say, no one can uh, call upon their personal authority to decide who is right and who is wrong. It's all out there, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, those who have the best documentation the, um, uh, of facts, uh, that's the truth that we agree upon at a certain time, and then we move on until somebody comes along and falsify that thesis, uh, and we have uh, a new version of uh, what is the best possible version of the truth. Uh, unfortunately, these enlightenment principles are being undermined. Uh, they used to be undermined by fundamentalists, religious and political, who said we are in position of the truth and there, therefore nobody has a right to ask any critical questions. Today, it's coming from the humanitarians who say that uh, there are certain things we should not be allowed to say and ask because it's offensive to somebody. And it's really undermining knowledge production and, uh, and critical thinking. And it also goes to the issue of, uh, of fake news, that we, we really have to, to reconquer uh, the fundamentals of the uh, Enlightenment to solve the internal crisis within the West, I, I think. So we have time for two more short questions. Uh, two quick questions for you. Um, quick. quick uh, what do you make of government funded news agencies and who should be the arbiter of historical facts? Uh, the second question, the arbiter of historical facts should be uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the community. Uh, you have a right, no matter whether you're a professional historian or not, to challenge uh, whatever is out there as historical facts. But you have to document it. And if you cannot document it, uh, uh, it should be refuted. Um, uh, and and uh, I'm, I don't like uh, public uh, funding of uh, media. But, you know, I live in a small country with only 5 million people, uh, where it's very difficult to... Uh, to, to turn private media into a um, flourishing business. Uh, so I'm, I'm less skeptical now, uh, uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe it should be done through you know, f foundations uh, and not uh, the state, but some kind of, it's, it's very difficult in this disruption, with this disruption uh, of the technology, and, and it's great that the gatekeepers are gone and everybody with a smartphone can communicate uh, with all the world, but, but it's clear that it's hurting um, quality journalism because it costs money. It's expensive to do uh, good journalism, and, and it's very difficult in the current situation to finance that through subscriptions and uh, advertisement. Okay, so we have one last question. Thanks. Um, at the time that you published the cartoons, were there any laws in Denmark against certain kinds of speech? And if so, why didn't you choose to publish something that was against the law rather than publishing the cartoons? Uh, they were not against the law, but we do have laws. Uh, we, in fact, have a blasphemy law in Denmark, and we have a hate speech law. And uh, uh, several Muslim organizations took me and the newspaper to court, uh, but they lost in three cases. And, and um, the, the attorney general in Denmark threw out the case uh, in the first hand because he, he is only allowed to take on a case if he believes that, that there is a chance for the state to win it. And uh, uh, so he, you know, I, I made the point that if you live in a democracy, you have to accept mockery ridicule in the text. And, and the attorney general said, that's not true. Uh, you don't have to accept that all the time because we have laws 
limiting uh, certain kinds of speech. We have black blasphemy law and we have a, a hate speech law. But, but he said, you know, these cartoons were published as part of a public debate about an issue that concerns everybody. It was not a deliberate attempt to, uh, you know, uh, attack anyone. Uh, it was an important public debate, and therefore he did not take on the case. And then they, they, there were two civil lawsuits, and the Muslim organization lost both. So, so, so this, this is within the law. That may not be the case today, because recently uh, the Attorney General, in fact, for the first time in 70 years, initiated a blasphemy case against a man who, who posted a short video of him burning a copy of the Quran. Um, and uh, I don't understand. I mean, uh, I think it's outrageous. You don't burn books uh, uh, no matter what. But, but uh, I think it's a free speech issue. And, and by, by, in fact, by, by pursuing this case, they are, they are making it far more, uh, you know, famous. And this clip will be watched uh, many, many, many thousand more times than uh, if uh, they hadn't done it. Um, uh, but this is just one example of the way that uh, free speech is, incre is in incre increasingly bad standing in Europe. And unfortunately, the the way the European politicians goes about it is that on the one hand, they celebrate diversity of cultures and religion. Say so it's great uh, that we have more diversity, but at the same time, they don't want diversity of opinions. Uh, and I think this goes hand in hand. If you welcome diversity of culture, ethnicity and religion, you also have to welcome more diversity of speech because if people really express themselves and what they believe in, then you will have these clashes uh, and differences of, uh, of opinion. Um, so, so, so free speech is being sacrificed on the altar of this uh, cultural and religious uh, diversity right now in Europe, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Right now, we will have a very short two, three-minute break. Stretch your legs, and then please come right...